If you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you can, but we're actually going to be starting in Psalm 73. Psalm 73, we're going to read a little bit in that psalm. Uh, we're going to look at something as a way of introduction, and then we'll jump to 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 1. Uh, wait, Pastor, when was the family conference again? No, I'm just kidding. All right, so Psalm 73, I had to. I'll probably ask him that question every single day for the rest of the time. No, I'm just kidding. All right, Psalm 73, you know, we're going to start, oh, probably around in verse, uh, we'll start in verse 16, maybe 15. Let's start in verse 15. We're going to read a few verses and then we'll pray, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we read in Psalm 73. And then we'll, we'll, we'll look at a thing that he says that, that I find very interesting um, in, in what the psalmist here says. Uh, and then we'll use that to talk about this idea that ignorance is not bliss uh, in our lives. So Psalm uh, 73, we'll start in verse 15. It says, If I say, I will speak thus, Behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Let's go ahead and pray, uh, and then we'll, we'll go and talk about this. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for the ability to come together, to open up your word, and to preach out of it. So, Lord, I just pray that uh, you get me out of the way, that you use me as a vessel. Lord, that uh, we, we talk about the truth. And so, Lord, as we talk about some things that we need to know and some things that are, that are going to happen, Lord, we pray that you just be with each one of us. Lord, that, that, that we, we can learn what your word has to say. Lord, we thank you for a perfect word we can come and preach out of. Lord, we pray that whatever is said and done here tonight just gives you glory, honor, and praise. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 73 is an interesting psalm. You know, pastors preached out of it before. You know, and if you read the first portion of Psalm 73, we didn't really go, you know, we're, just for the sake of time, we're not going to read the whole psalm. But, but the idea is, here is a man who is looking at the world, right? And what he sees in the world is something that, you know, in, in his mind, it shouldn't be happening, right? He, he sees, you know, people who, who are doing wrong, yet prospering. You know, he, he sees, you know, the, it says in verse 12, he says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. You know, you, I'm sure you, you've seen it, and, and, and maybe you've seen it in your family, you know, we have, that people who serve the Lord seem to struggle the most. You know, and so, so, so it's tempting sometimes to turn our eyes off of where they need to be and onto the world and say, how are they getting it done? Right? They're, these are ungodly people. And, and what he says, he says, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation. It says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. You know, pastor talked about the truth. We're going to talk about the truth again. You know, sometimes the truth is painful. You know, the saying is, truth hurts. It does, right? The, the, the Bible, the truth, is likened to a two-edged sword. It cuts. It hurts. We're also going to talk about that sometimes the best type of healing comes after a hurt. And so what, what he says is, hey, when I thought to know this, I, it was too painful. So what did he do? He went to church. Right? He went to church. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then he learned something. He learned something about himself in verse 22. And this is where we're going to jump off. And, and in verse 22 it says, so foolish was I. Right? There, there's something to be said about getting in the presence of truth. 
and learning something about yourself. Here he is, he, he, he realizes what he did was wrong, right? Ooh, I shouldn't have been comparing myself with the ungodly, with the people of the world, no matter how successful they are. But he says, so foolish was I, and we're going to focus on that word, ignorant. Ignorant, right? He knew the truth, but he chose to ignore it. You know, that you, you might have heard the phrase, you know, ignorance is bliss. You know, what you don't know can't hurt you. Right? That, 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 that the idea of, yes, there is truth out there, but if I just kind of close my ears to it, then I'm not responsible for it. No, you're still responsible for it. You know, ignorance is defined as the want, absence, or destitution of knowledge. You know, there, there's something about that word ignorant, and, and, and that the idea of ignorance is you have the access to the knowledge. You have the access to the truth. We can go to the dollar store and pick up the truth. We just don't want it. That's being ignorant. That's not being unlearned, right? There's things that we just don't know because we haven't learned them, and that's okay. You know, the, the Bible talks about being unlearned, but we need to study. You know, we need to study those things out. But this is a willful ignorance, right? This is a, I don't want to know these things because they hurt. You know, pastor preached about truth this morning, and, and, and we talked about the truth hurts. You know, one of the reasons why I think we don't want the truth is because it hurts. One of the reasons why we don't read the Bible is because we know it's going to cut us when we read it. It's going to show us who we truly are, and that truth hurts. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul commands us, though. There, there, there's six times, there, there's a phrase that we're going to see. It says, I would not have you ignorant brethren. It's used seven times in the Bible. Don't worry, we're not going to look at all seven. We might get to three. Um, but here, Paul, Paul says, as Christians, there are things that we should not be ignorant of. No matter how much it's going to hurt, no matter how hard sometimes it is to learn these lessons, we don't need to be ignorant of them. And the first one we see that we're going to look at is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. Right? So he starts off, hey, this is something we don't want you guys to be ignorant about. What does he not want us to be ignorant about? It says, of our trouble, uh-oh, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had in the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. You know, one of the so, so what's Paul saying? Hey guys, I don't want you to be ignorant of the suffering that's going to take place in your life. I, I understand, you know, this is a, a very popular topic to preach on, you know, very uplifting. You know, there was a time in my life when I was uh, uh, just preaching, and, and Amy came up to me and says, Brett, is there anything else you preach on other than suffering? I'm like, tis the season, <laughs> I guess. You know, as pastors, you get into just these seasons of things where, you know, we're just dealing with something, and God is showing us something out of the Word, and it just happens to to fall in line in these different topics. And, and here is one topic that just, you know, isn't very well much preached on, as we'll see, but it's very important, right? That as Christians, we are going to suffer. So let's look at this and, and, and some of the things that we can learn about, right? Because he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of it. So let's learn something from it. So what's the first thing is, is trouble. In, in verse 8, it says, of our trouble. You know, there's going to be trouble. As Christians... We are going to face trouble. You realize we face the same troubles that an unsaved person does. Right? We, we go through deaths in the family. We go through friends forsaking us. But, you know, we have something different. Right? We have a comfort in us. We have a hope in us that we're going to see at the end of the sermon. There, there's a hope in each one of us, if we are saved, that we can rest on, that we can look towards. And, and something that we shouldn't be ignorant of either. And so, but listen to how Paul, right, because I understand that sometimes, you know, when I say, man, I'm so troubled, 
you know, my alarm clock didn't go off and I woke up a half an hour later. I mean, praise the Lord for that. But, you know, sometimes we think of uh, our troubles are, are, are just minor things. Because listen to how Paul described his troubles. He was pressed out of measure. Right? He was pressed out of measure. You know, you can think of a vice, right? Something that's, that's pressing, that changes the shape of something. Here Paul is in Asia being pressed out of measure. He says, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Paul is on the verge of death, or what he thought. He, he is being persecuted and being troubled so much that he says, hey, I'm going to die. You know, it's interesting, this idea of trouble in a Christian's life. You know, I was thinking about this. You know, God goes as, so far as to promise it to us. You know, in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, Yea, all that live godly shall, promise word, shall suffer persecution. You know, we, we shall suffer persecution. So here's a question. This has nothing to do with the sermon. But, hey, if you're not suffering persecution, are you living godly? I mean, God says, if you're going to live godly, you will suffer persecution. It's a promise. You know, a problem with Christianity today is we are ignorant of this point. You know, is that a new Christian gets saved, and, and what has been told to them is, man, your life is going to be cloud nine. It's going to be easy peasy, right? Unicorns and rainbows. They wake up the, <laughs> they wake up the next morning, and... And, you know, they, they hit their first sign of trouble, and, and what happens to them? Ooh, I didn't sign up for this. I thought my life was going to be easy. I thought I was going to pray for a Mercedes, and God was just going to drop it from heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does he say that. You know what he says? He says, hey, you guys are going to be troubled. You guys are going to be troubled. But, you know, in verse 8, he says, I despaired even of life. You know what God uses trouble to do for us? He uses trouble to bring us to our end. Right? Because at our end, God can begin to work. You know, this is when God's strength can show through. We're in 2 Corinthians. Let's flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. You know, I love, I love this, this verse. I love this verse. But the problem is, is I kind of forget the verses around it and even the chapter before it and what Paul has to go through for him to say this. You know, and, and he said unto me, God is speaking to Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore... Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore, I take pleasure. You know, Paul has a great, great way of, of, you know, stabbing us with some verses. But not only stabbing us, but then twisting the knife. You know, here he says, hey, you know, my strength is made perfect most gladly. Right? He says, most gladly, therefore, will I glory. And then not only, he doesn't stop there. In verse 10, he says, therefore, I take pleasure. That means Paul is happy about it. He's taking pleasure in the infirmities that he's suffering, in reproaches and necessities and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. Why? For when I am weak, then am I strong. Here is a person who is not ignorant of the trouble that he's going to face. And he's not ignorant of the things he's going to learn and God is going to accomplish in those troubles. You know, we, we talk about 2 Corinthians 12, right? So how does, you know, if you think about it, my grace is sufficient for thee. How do we learn that? We, we won't read all of them, but if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you read the list of what Paul actually went through, that's a hefty list. You know, he says, uh, of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, saved one. So he's beaten 39 times. Five, five total times of 39 stripes. You know, that's 195 total stripes. Can you imagine the scars? Can you imagine every time that he looks around and he sees those scars, what he thinks? 
<laughs> my grace is sufficient for thee. You know, there are things that we go through. The troubles in our lives will leave scars. Those scars are a reminder of what God has brought us through. And we can look back at those and say, yeah, I remember when I got that. God was there every step of the way. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Right? So there's trouble, right? Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of the suffering that's going to happen to you. You know, and, and what, what's going to happen is the trouble. But what does the trouble, why, why? Right? That's the question is, why do we have to go through trouble? Let's go in verse 9. Let's read in verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust, trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. We're not supposed to be ignorant of the suffering that comes in our lives. Why? Because we can learn something from it. What do we learn from the troubles in our lives is who are we trusting? Here, Paul is saying, man, we, there was a sentence of death in ourselves. We realize we can't trust ourselves you know our, our trouble you know you know sometimes the troubles that we face make us stronger and that and that's true right the more troubles that we go through the stronger that we get at least with our faith but you know what trouble actually does for us it reveals who we are you know the suffering that we go through that's just kind of the refiner's fire right we, you know you we think we're pure and then here comes some fire some trials that come and all that dross rises. And we think, well, where'd that come from? Here's Paul saying, you know, he, I mean, one of the greatest Christians, I mean, I would probably say the greatest Christian in the Bible, right? And, and here he says, we, 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 we learned that we should not trust in ourselves. Are we able to trust God when we can't see him in the storms? Right? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if we're, everybody's going to go through trouble. If you're not going through right now, like Pastor says, let's use the word yet. Because it's going to happen. And you know, when we're in that trouble, we're like the disciples in the storm. It's really hard for us to see. So who are we trusting? God is there even when we don't real, when, even when we can't see it. Let's go to Romans. We're, we're going to read this. Romans chapter 5. You know, we, we should place our trust in God because he doesn't change. You know, God doesn't change. You know, that's why he says, you know, we know um, he, he, he's not going to change. That, that's why we trust him. We cannot get ourselves through some of the troubles that we face. I, I understand. I, I'm very prideful sometimes. I, I know what you, yeah, I know. Got a confession here. I'm prideful. Hi, my name is Brett, and I struggle with pride. You know, and, and, and one of the things that I struggle with the most is when something is happening, I think, yeah, I, I got it. Have you, has anybody ever asked you for help and say, yeah, I got it. I got it. You know, you know that's, a, that's a sign of pride. Somebody is trying to help you out, and you're saying, no, I got it. I don't need any help. You know, God tries to help us through the trouble, and you know sometimes what we say? <laughs> no, Lord, I got it. I can do it. And God's going right, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm ready. Romans chapter 5, have you ever looked at a situation and thought this? I have no idea how I'm going to get through this. I have. You know, we're moving to te you know, when we were moving to Texas, we had a house to sell, a house to buy, and, and I mean, we're moving 16 hours away from our house, and I'm looking at that situation going, I have no idea how this is going to work out. But you know who did? God did. And God worked it out. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Again, there's that thing about glorying in tribulations, right? Here comes a tribulation, and hey, thank you, Lord, for this. And it says, you know, be thankful in all things. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know, sometimes God shows his love through those trials. But the only way we experience the love of God like that is by going through the trials. You know, sometimes the hope of God is shown through the darkest situations. 
2 Corinthians, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So what do trials, what do troubles, what, are the, what, what can we learn, right? Because we're not supposed to be ignorant. Great, yep, Brett, I know we're going to suffer. Great. What are some things that we can learn through the suffering? One, where our trust lies. Here's the second one. Verse 10, Paul writes, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust, and will yet deliver us. You know, Paul gets a testimony out of his trial, out of his trouble. Because Paul went through some things, he is able then to testify of God's power. You know, we, we, we were... You know, we, sometimes we do testimonies here. Does anybody want to testify, right? And you know what that is? That's a time to show everybody what God has done in your life. Hey, God got me through this. God got me through that. And you know what it does? It, it does something for you, but, but really, it does something for the people that are around you. That we're able to see our God work and our God's power. You know, if you read the book of Philippians... Right? Philippians is an interesting book in that the, the main words in Philippians are rejoice and joy. Now, that, that might not seem like, like a strange thing. Yeah, great, Paul wrote about joy and rejoicing. Yeah, but you know where Paul wrote about joy and rejoicing in Philippians? He wrote it from prison. And not only prison, right? Because I always find this fascinating, right? Whenever Paul was arrested or any of these, you know, Christians were arrested, they just didn't take, like, one person and say, all right, come with me, let's go. They would bring, like, a whole group of people, like six or seven or eight of the strongest people, and they would put the heaviest shackles on them, you know, like Paul's going to run, right? And then they would put him in the darkest dungeon. And yet Paul talks about rejoicing. Paul talks about having joy. This is why. Because he knew he was going to suffer. Let's go to Acts. Acts, chapter 9. Start in verse, we'll, we'll read verse 15. Just to let you guys know, this is bonus, right? This isn't even in my notes. Acts chapter 9, verse 15, right? We were talking about Paul's suffering. Paul wasn't ignorant of the suffering he was going to face. Could you imagine, right? And, and I want you guys to put yourselves in Paul's shoes. So here is a man, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, a, a learned man in the, in, the, in, the, in the law, and he's persecuting the church of God, and then here comes Christ one day on the road to Damascus and strikes him blind. And then he says this, Verse 15, it says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. Right? Talking about Ananias, who's going to talk to Paul and, and, and you know, do some things with Paul. But th this is what God says to Ananias. It says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Great. Lord, I'm willing to go. I'll preach to whoever you want me to preach. But there's a verse 16. Here's verse 16. It says, And for, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Could you imagine you pray one night and say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And God says, great, I want you to go preach to this group of pre people. Praise the Lord, I'll be on the next flight out. And then he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to show you how great things you will suffer. How many of us will be hesitant then? <laughs> you know, Lord, I, I don't know if I heard you right. Let's pump the brakes on that a little bit. Suffering? I don't know. So what's the point? What's the point of Paul going through trials? What's the point of us not being ignorant of the trials we are going to face? The point is we are then able to comfort one another, right? There's a point to all of this, right? There's, Paul isn't saying, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant of this just so that you know it, right? He's not like a, a high school teacher. I want you to do this assignment just because I want you out of my hair and to do the busy work. Paul says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I want you to know this 
so that when somebody else is going through a trial, you can go up next to them and say, hey, I know how you're feeling. Here's how God got me through it. Right? And we're able to comfort somebody else. So what's another thing that Paul says we shouldn't be ignorant of? If you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read in verse 11. Now start in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 2, 10. Something that I found that we shouldn't be ignorant of. I mean, I mean, Paul says it a little bit stronger in this passage, but it's still something for us to keep in mind. And it says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgave also, or I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, I was, I was reading this and doing some studying before I came up, and, and, and I read that. It says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So we know how Satan's going to work, right? This is what he's saying. One of the things that we need to be as Christians is not ignorant of Satan's devices. So then why are so many Christians being hurt and being tripped up by Satan. Because we know how he works. All in here. You know, it's like, uh, if you think about it, you know, Satan left his playbook, playbook out and God put it in the Bible for us. We just have to find it. You know, Paul tells the Corinthian church that we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. So what, 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 what is one of the devices? What, what's the context of this passage where we can start to see one of Satan's devices? And, and the context of this passage is, if you remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man. There was a man who did something that the Gentiles didn't even do. That's how bad that sin was. right? It wasn't even named among the Gentiles. They didn't even have a name for what he did. And if you remember the story, you know, Paul says, you got to get him out, right? you got to get him out of the church because he's doing it in the open, you know, and, and just get him out. You know, reading this passage, and, and this is where we come to 2 Corinthians. You know that guy repents? You know that guy gets right? I was thinking about that today. Nobody ever preaches on that, right? We preach on forgiving the guy. We preach on what he did in 1 Corinthians 5. But what did it take for him to get right? You know, pastor said it before when he talked about the prodigal son. You realize the longest journey the prodigal son took was to himself? That had to have been the longest journey, right? Oh, man, I'm a sinner. I know how long it took me to realize it. You know, sometimes that's our longest journey is to realize that, that the issue is... But, but he does. And here's what Paul is saying. is Paul is saying, hey, he repented. He wants to come back. You guys should forgive him. And you should let him back in the church. Now, why? In verse 11, it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. You know what Satan wants to do to the church? He wants to divide it. That's what Satan does. Satan divides. He tries to divide. And here is a man who is seeking forgiveness. You know, and if the church didn't forgive him, you know, there's going to be two camps in that church. There's going to be the camp that says, yeah, we should forgive him. There's going to be the other camp that says, hey, I can't forgive what he did. You know what Paul says? Forgive him. Lest Satan should get an advantage. Unless Satan comes in subtly to divide. You know, Paul doesn't say it here, but it's something to take note. Here, here they're telling to forgive him. You know what Paul doesn't say? Forgive him and then remind him every day of what he did. You know what he also didn't say? He said, hey, you that, you that repented and got right, don't you go telling everybody what you did. Right? Because we can easily say, yeah, amen, don't bring up the past. But, but here's a man who shouldn't be broadcasting what he did either. And so we need to not be ignorant of these devices, of these divisions that Satan is going to try. So Satan is going to try, I see three areas that Satan tries to divide. And the first one is the church. Right? We see it here. Satan tries to divide brother against brother, brother against sister, sister against sister. And, and the way that he does it 
is through unforgiveness. You know what happens if you don't forgive somebody? They are now a thorn in your flesh. They are a thorn in your side. You know, if you don't forgive some, you know, and it doesn't, and I'm not necessarily talking about these big things. I'm talking about, hey, you parked in my parking spot. Hey, you sat in my seat on Sunday. I know we're all good Baptists in here. We have our seats. Trust me. I understand. Or, you know, hey, you said so-and-so's potato salad is better than mine. I understand how it works. You know, if you don't forgive, get, forgive that, the next time you see that person, you know what's going to happen in your mind? Why are they here? Who invited them? Man, look at them. They're sitting in my seat again. You know, one more strike and I'm out. Satan tries to get brother against brother. You know, the truth is made to divide. You know, Jesus, in Luke 12, we're not going to turn there, but he, but he says, I, I, I came to divide. Actually, let's go there. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 51. And obviously these attacks, you know, Satan doesn't really work out in the open, right? Just like obvious attacks. He does it subtly. You know, in the research that I was doing about Satan and some of his devices, right, it says he walketh about like a roaring lion. And, you know, sometimes when you do research for a sermon, it gets fun. You know, because I was thinking, well, you know, he walketh about like a roaring lion. How do lions walk about? Or how do lions hunt? So guess what I got to do? Watch videos on lions hunting, right? And it's actually pretty impressive. Like, lions are so quiet that they could be right behind you and you wouldn't even know it. And then they could roar. Their, 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 their roar is so loud. Right? I remember we went to the zoo once, and actually the lions were roaring. And that was the first time I've ever heard it. And it scared me. And there's a big pane of glass between me and them, and then even a gate and some more space. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to be lunch. Right? But, but that's, Satan is very quiet. And just like a lion hunting, he'll divide the weak from the rest of the group and the young from the rest of the group. That's how Satan works. Satan works to divide. Luke chapter 12, verse 51, it says, Suppose ye, this is Jesus talking, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Truth divides. But you know what truth shouldn't divide? Two believers of the same truth. You know, if you're saved in here today and a, and a Bible believer, we believe the Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. If you believe that, you should not divide over small little tiny things. Because you have the same final authority. We have the same Truth. So all these divisions that are occurring over these little tiny insignificant things, that's Satan working. And he's trying to divide, causing fights, breaking up the church. Satan will not try to just get brother against brother or Christian against Christian, but he will try to get the pastor divided off from the flock. He'll try to get the shepherd away from the flock, right? Because he's a wolf. And if you think about it, the wolf feasts better when the shepherd is away. You know, in Galatians 4, Paul says, What, have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. You know, a pastor stands up here and preaches the truth. You know, we, we try and, and we do a very good job, in my opinion, of sticking to what the Bible says. And sometimes, like we said, the truth hurts. It cuts. It should. It purifies. Like a little bit of the salt, we said. Salt helps cleanse things. But it stings at the same time. And you know what happens? Is we think in our mind, oh man, you know, that pastor, he rubbed me the wrong way. I think it was Bob Jones, maybe it was Jack Hiles, who said, you know, if I rub your cat the wrong way, turn the cat around. Because that's what we need to do. You know, when, when, whenever, as Bible believers, whenever we come in conflict with the Bible, guess who's right? God is right. All the time. Ooh, I don't like what that says. Well, too bad. God is right. I am wrong. 
You know, so, so Satan will try to get the pastor divided off from the flock. Let's go to Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Satan's going to try to divide the church. Satan tries to divide the family. You know, Satan knows that the strength of the church is found in the families that are in it. You know, that's the pillar with which the church is, I mean, obviously, the doctrinally, the pillar with which the church is built on is Jesus Christ and the Apostles' Doctrine in Ephesians. But, but with the people, with regards to the people in the church, it's built on the families. And so if you start to see families fall aside, not only is Satan going to hurt the church, but Satan is going to hurt the next generation of the church. Satan's smart. Job chapter 2, we know the story of Job, right? The first, in Job chapter 1, Satan comes in front of God and says, Hey, here's this man Job. And, and, and God says, Yeah, he's a perfect man that escheweth evil. Could you imagine God saying that about us? Yeah, have, have you seen my servant down here? He's a perfect man that escheweth evil. Satan obviously says, and, and obviously I'm paraphrasing this, but Satan says, yeah, but, but that's because you're protecting him, God. Let me take away all of his stuff. God says, okay, but you can't touch his life. Satan goes down and, and takes everything, all of, his, all of his kids, all of his animals, all of his wealth. And yet, in verse 21 of chapter 1, in Job, it says, And naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still doesn't sin. So then Satan comes back and says, Yeah, God, I, I took away all his stuff, like you said, but, but let me take away his health, right? Let me take away his health, because once we do that, then he's going to sin. And God says, Okay, you can take away his health, just do not touch his life. Right? You can't kill him. And so what happens in verse 9 of Job chapter 2 is we get something that his wife says. And, and there's been preachers that have jumped all over Job's wife, somewhat deservedly. But I would say we, we kind of come to a hasty judgment about Job's wife. Imagine that you are a wife and your husband, and you lost all of your kids, lost all of your animals, lost everything in the same day. Right? Because she lost it too. But then she just lost her husband. Yeah, I know he's still alive, but he had boils from head to toe. He was in excruciating pain. And in verse 9 it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. You know, it's interesting when, when you think about this. Where did Job's wife get those words, curse God and die? If you look earlier in the story, he gets them from Satan, right? That, that's a very similar phrasing to what Satan uses. And you know what Satan does? Satan tries to come in subtly into our families. And he tries to work his way in. And, and unfortunately, today, he is doing a really good job. You know why? Because we're ignorant of his devices. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. How does he do this? Right, because we're not supposed to be ignorant, right? And, and what did we say the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 was, where we said, you know, lest we give him an advantage. The context was forgiveness. The context was forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Those two phrases are connected to whereas if we let the sun go down upon our wrath, we then give place to the devil. You know what happens if we don't take care of situations before we go to bed? They tend to fester. There's a lack of forgiveness there. And so what happens is then Satan has a place to start working, to start to divide. You know, the church, Satan's devices are, are, are used to subtly divide the church, 
He, he uses them to subtly, subtly divide our families, and he uses it to subtly divide us from God. He gets us away. You know, we'll, we'll go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, just because I want to cover it in conclusion. But, but you know, there's a saying that Satan tries to get a Christian backslidden, right? That living in sin, you know, doing the things of the world, doing the things of the flesh. So that's what Satan's first goal for us is. Is he, is he, is he tries to get us backslidden. He, he tries to get us back into the world. If he can't do that, then he tries to get us busy. Well, I'm just too busy to go to church, right? You know, I, I got to get up Sunday morning. Now, I, what I'm not saying is if you have to work on Sunday to support your family, I, I, th- this doesn't apply to the situation. But if you, you know, are running the quote-unquote rat race, right? If you are trying just to earn the extra buck and, and the boss says, hey, you can come in on Sunday to work overtime. You don't have to, but you can. And your response is, yep, I'll be there. That's getting us busy, right? Where we get too busy to serve God. And then if he can't get us backslidden, if he can't get us busy, then he gets us bitter. Because Satan knows the, the, the end result of us being bitter at somebody else, it always turns on God. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about a root of bitterness springing up. And that bitterness grows, and that bitterness grows, and then we start getting bitter against God, and now we have separated. We have split. God has divided us. You know, Paul tells us not to be ignorant of suffering. You know, it's going to happen. We're going to go through troubles. Paul tells us that we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. But I want to leave you guys with a little bit of hope. Yes, we are going to suffer. Yes, we are under attack by the enemy, by, by Satan. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Yeah, you know, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. You're going to suffer. Paul says, yeah, you're going to be under attack by an enemy that's very subtle. Paul then says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant that there is coming a day that we are going to hear the trump of God. We are going to hear God's voice say, come up hither, and we're going to be ever with the Lord. All suffering, all fighting is over, and we will be with the Lord forever. We don't need to be ignorant of that. That's what we need to be looking toward, because there is coming a day. There is coming a day. So Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. Right? Ignorance, we talked about, was a willful, just, oh yeah, that's the truth, eh, I don't want it. Let's not be ignorant. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. You know, we, we said God says... You know, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. You know, the, our, our adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But you know what else God says? Hey, God says, I didn't forget you guys. There's coming a day I'm going to come and get you. Let's remember that. Let's go and pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for all that you've given to us.
Lord, despite the trouble that we might be going through in our life, despite the things that might be occurring, the attacks, the trouble, Lord, we thank you that you are there for us and that you are there through the storms. Lord, we, we love you. Lord, we pray that uh, we can remember some of the things that you told us in your word. And Lord, we thank you for the truth, that we can trust it. Lord, and we just thank you and love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to, you have a, a few minutes while the piano plays.